May ngā ke sinu tanan tanan. Blessing is always together together with you this morning. Looking forward to continuing our study through the book of Hebrews. Before we begin, let's open up with a word of prayer. Salam alaykum wa gino para sa niyad lao, Father. We just thank you for the opportunity, Lord, this morning, Lord, to get into your word, to hear from you. Lord, desiring, Father, to both be blessed, Lord, and also, Lord, to have our hearts checked. Lord, as we come into the first of the warnings of the book of Hebrew, Lord, the exhortations not to ignore what it is that you have written, not to ignore the salvation that you've provided. Lord, we do pray that you challenge our hearts, both to ourselves, make sure that we are following after you, Lord, and also the importance of sharing about you with our friends, family, loved ones. So, Lord, meet us here in this time, we pray and ask. Blessed we say, in Jesus' name, amen. We recall something they get. <laughs> As we begun the book of Hebrews, we thought it was divided into two key sections. From chapter 1 through chapter 10, verse 19, is the doctrinal section of the book of Hebrews, showing that Jesus Christ is better than everyone and everything. Paglabaw sa tanan tanan gid. And then the second half of the book, the conclusion, beginning in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 20, all the way through Hebrews chapter 13, verse 25, is the application. So you have the doctrinal, and you have the application. <clears throat> the application is in light of the fact that Jesus is better than everyone and everything, how then should we live our lives? And of course, the answer is by faith in Jesus Christ alone. We picked up in verse 1, chapter 1, through the end of chapter 1, verse 14, talking about the fact that Jesus was better than the prophets, and he's better than the angels. He was better than the angels, as we saw, in eight critical ways, because he had a better name, because the angels worshipped him, because the angels served him, because, frankly, Jesus Christ is God, because he's anointed by God, in fact. The word Christ, we say Jesus Christ, sometimes we think that's his last name. Christ means the anointed one. He is the one who has been anointed by God. He created the angels. He is eternal. He has neither beginning or end. And although God uses angels, ultimately it's through Jesus Christ alone that we have victory. Hey, listen, the writer of Hebrews is really getting emphatic that there is no one and nothing as amazing, as powerful, as incredible as our Lord. Which brings us to chapter 2. As we pick up in chapter 2, the writer is going to pause for four verses. He's going to continue in chapter 2 talking about the fact that Jesus is greater than the angels. But he's going to talk for a moment in light of everything he's already stated, better than the prophets, better than the angels, to say we better be listening to Jesus Christ. We best be paying attention to the word. Let's pick up Hebrews chapter 2 beginning in verse 1 and we'll go down through to verse 4. Hebrews chapter 2 beginning in verse 1. Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first was begun to be spoken by the Lord, but was confirmed to us by those who heard it, also by God bearing witness, both with signs and wonders and with various miracles, and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will." As we come to chapter 2 of the book of Hebrews, there are three things we want to notice and look at in these four short verses this morning. Now the author, having begun by talking about how Jesus is better than the prophets, better than the angels, takes this pause to emphasize the fact that we need to consider the things that we have heard. In light of all that we've been presented with, in light of all that we see that Jesus Christ is, we need to make sure that we are listening to the commands, the words, the faith is salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. This is the first of five major warnings given throughout the book of Hebrews. But the first question we need to ask ourselves about this warning is, who is the warning to? For notice it says, therefore pointing back to, in light of Jesus being better than the prophets and the angels, we need to give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard. Who is the we we are talking about? 
there are two possibilities. The first possibility as to who this we is that this warning is being given to is Christians. Mga tao may pagtuo sila sa ginoo. Those who have faith in the Lord. For the idea is the author of the book, who is a believer, is writing to other believers, telling them, listen, we need to give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard. But I have to say, if this is the case, and it's the first of two possibilities, that this is written to, this warning is given to believers, it's quite provocative. It's actually very heavy. Because the suggestion would be the implication is those who are saved, those who do currently, so Bongid, have faith in Jesus Christ, we need to keep hold of our faith, keep following Jesus Christ, lest we will drift away from the Lord. This touches on that idea of our eternal security. Can a Christian ultimately reject and turn away from their faith in Jesus Christ? Now, there are those who say, they're adamant, they say, they argue that nothing can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ, Romans chapter 8, verse 38. They go to John chapter 10, verse 28 and say, no one can snatch you out of God's hand. They go back to John chapter 3, verse 3, and say, we have been born again in Jesus Christ. How could some of them be unborn? That doesn't make any sense. And they argue this impossible, completely ridiculous, to suggest that we could ever lose the salvation that we have received from Christ by faith. The problem with that is, we do know there are those who have walked away from Christ. You may personally know some people in your life. <laughs> You're listening today and you are the person. You happen to click on a link and are listening to the teaching and you're going, I, I, I used to believe, I used to go to church, but I no longer do. The reality is there are those who commit apostasy. Those who reject the faith they once received. Even, by the way, in the Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, tells us about a man named Demas. Demas, who had been a fellow laborer and believer with the Apostle Paul, walked away from Christ, for he loved the things of this world more than God. So there really is no question that there are those who had faith, who rejected their faith. And those who hold to this idea of you cannot lose your salvation, they argue, well, those people were just never really saved. They were imposters. They were pretenders. But they didn't have genuine true faith. That's why they walked away. For if you had had genuine faith, you could not have left because nothing can separate us. My problem with that point of view, that particular doctrinal perspective, is it misses the point. You're arguing terminology. You were never saved versus you fell away from the Lord. I don't really care how you want to label it. The practicality, the bottom line is that there are people who at one point in time did profess Jesus Christ and today no longer do. Whether you want to say that they fell away or they were just never saved, the bottom line is the same. They no longer follow Jesus. Why? What caused them to turn their back on something they once accepted? What can make someone reject the gospel message? And the answer is singular. There is only one thing. There's only one thing that can turn us to walk away from and to reject Jesus Christ, to let our faith drift away. And that is sin. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, which is the next of the warnings we'll get to, do guy, do guy, says, Beware, my brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But ignore, exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest your heart be hardened from the deceitfulness of sin. Oh, precious believer, please listen. Pamati, pamati, gid. Sin is the Biggest danger that we face. Pinamas delicado para sa aton. Piskin ko may pagtoo kita. Just because we believe in Jesus Christ doesn't mean we're safe from the dangers of sin. For any time we make a choice to rebel against God, do something we know we should not, it hardens our heart. Now, we have an option. Pariminal sol. 
We can repent. We can come back to the Lord any time. But if we do not, it starts us down a path where God is trying to call us to repent, but we harden. He calls us to repent. We harden. Suddenly we stop reading our Bible. We harden. We stop going to church. We harden more. We stop praying. We become very hard. Until it's possible to actually walk away, turn away, reject that salvation we once received by faith. And that is very likely the possibility of what Paul, or the writer of Hebrews here, is addressing, hey, give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard, lest we drift away. Lest we turn from the living God. For our true salvation is not just the day we believe in Jesus. Really, our true salvation is the day we make it to see Jesus. As Paul would write in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, I have finished the race. I have kept, sakatapusan, to the very end, the faith. And so this is the first possibility this is written to, this warning is given to believers. But there's a second possibility. Therefore, in light of the fact that Jesus is greater than the prophets, greater than the angels, this we who need to give the more earnest heed is referring to among a judeo, walapalu asila, Jews who are not yet saved, Jews who are the core audience of who this book was written to for it is written to the Hebrews that is the title of the book because the thought is the Jews trusted in their good works to save them ang pensar sa mga Hudeo was kay buot buot sila because they were really good people therefore God would accept them but there's a problem with this idea of good for Jesus himself would address this in Mark chapter seven, 10, verse 17. In Mark 10, 17, there was a rich young ruler. And he comes to Jesus and he bows down before him and he says, Good master, what good thing must I do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? In other words, paano pwede magato ko sa langit? And Jesus answered this rich young ruler with a question. Why do you call me good? For there is none good but God. And now on the surface, that can seem confusing. What was Jesus' point? He had an honest question being given to him. How do I get to heaven? You'd think Jesus would just say, this is the way. But the dilemma that he had was Jesus needed to clarify to this man what good meant. For good is a very interesting, very potentially confusing word. For it's always comparative. I am good compared to something. I'll give you an example. I'm not a big fan, to be honest, of balut. Just not my favorite food. But if you gave me an option and said, Ano mas namian? What's better, balut or konduta? Would I rather eat balut or dirt? Hey, compared to dirt, balut is good. It depends what you're comparing it to. Now, if you compare balut to ice cream, hey, balut no longer looks so fancy. I'm going to prefer ice cream. Ice cream is good and not the balut. The idea being, good compares, always. It is a comparison word. So when we sit there and say, I think I am a good person, who are we comparing ourselves to? Good compared to the man in prison who's a murderer? Sure. If you want to compare me to the guy in prison who's a murderer, but go. I'm a very good person. But that's my standard. The question is, what is God's standard? And Jesus was clarifying to this rich young ruler that to God, the standard of goodness is God. If you want to be good, you have to be as good as God is. In fact, Jesus would outright state this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And when you understand that is the standard of goodness, if we want to get there on our own merit, never sin even once. Which is why we're told in Romans 3.23, there is none good. <laughs> All have sinned and fallen short of the standard, the glory of God. So whether this is written to the Christians 
warning them to continue in the faith, or to the Jews to show them they were not good enough on their own and they needed Jesus Christ to be the source of their faith. The point is the same. The application is still for you and I. We need to give the more earnest attention to the things we have heard. Which is the second thing we want to notice. Not only the therefore, who is this written to, but this give heed. Give the more earnest thing to the things we have heard. Now, the idea here is that we must, it is required, it is of the utmost importance that we give earnest heed. Bit of an unusual term. It just means sa bilog sa aton attention. We want to give our complete focus, completely give all that we are to what we have heard. Ano pamatikita? What have we heard? That Jesus Christ is better than everyone and everything. We want to make sure that we pay attention to that, not just hear it, but ultimately obey it. Give our whole faith and confidence in life to Jesus, lest we drift away. Now this word drift away really here is the key. For the idea is if we just listen, pamatinelang, and we don't give the earnest heed, all of our attention, our total lives, over to this idea that Jesus Christ is everything, then the message of the gospel is going to drift right by us. The word used only here in the New Testament is a, a term for a boat that has no oars, has no engine, just kind of moving with the waves, and it just drifts right by the dock that it's supposed to land in. It misses its destination, slowly just moving by it, never ever getting to where it was supposed to be. And the idea is, is that if we don't respond to the gospel, if we're not listening and acting on the fact that Jesus is better than everyone and everything, we're going to be like the first soil in the parable of the seed in the sower, Mark chapter 4, verse 15, where Satan comes in and steals that word out of our heart and it never takes root, never blossoms. We never become what God intends us to be. Listen, we need to hold fast to the word. We need to give heed to the word. We need to give attention, our full lives over to this idea of Jesus Christ or we're going to miss the message, the salvation that God desires to give to us. Because there are two ways we can approach our Bible. We can approach our Bible as a mirror or as an instruction manual. If it's an instruction manual, it is telling us everything we need to do. It is giving us rules, regulations, how to live our lives. But if it's just a mirror, it means we look in it, we see who we are, but then we walk away and forget what we looked like. In fact, James would say the same thing in James chapter 1, verse 23. If anyone is a hearer of the word, but not a doer of the word, He's like a man that observes himself in a mirror. And after he observes himself, he walks away and immediately he chooses to forget what he saw. Now, I can kind of appreciate this example of a mirror. When I wake up in the morning, if I walk in the bathroom and I look in that mirror and I go, Oh, pow, sinoina. He's ugly. Turn off the lights. I don't want to see him. And I want to walk away and choose to forget what I saw. Now, that wasn't the mirror's fault. The mirror was just being honest. The mirror was trying to tell me, reveal to me who I really am, what I look like. But I can do one of two things when I see that mirror. I can allow it to motivate me to change what I look like. Or I can walk away and forget what I look like. And many people do the second when it comes to the Word of God. The Word of God is that espio. We come into the Word. We see that Jesus Christ is everything. He is our one and all. He is above everyone and everything who we should put our complete confidence, trust in, who we should live for. The Word makes that very clear. But we can look at that and say, that's true. And then walk away and choose to forget it. Go about living our life our way rather than God's way and we will slip away. We will drift away from the message and the power and the transforming work of what God desires to do in our lives. And the sad thing is if we do that, 
our lives never change. We never do become what God intends. Therefore, the warning is, give the more earnest heed. Hold fast. Apply. Obey the things that we have heard. That Jesus is better than everyone and everything. Lest we drift away. This is the second thing we want to notice. Look at verse 2. For there's an example given on why it is so important to listen to what's being said. For we have the word of angels. Notice the writer says, If the word spoken through angels proved steadfast or true, we would say it is unquestionable. And now that does bring up the question, what is the word that the angels delivered? According to Acts chapter 7 verse 38 in Galatians 3.19, it is the Ten Commandments, the law of God. So the angels were the ones who delivered to men the message of God, the law of God, the commandments of God. And anybody who transgressed those commandments, the word transgression means to openly rebel, to refuse to obey. Or anybody who disobeyed, there's a second word here used in verse 2. Anybody who disobeyed, the word disobeyed means they refuse to listen. So they refuse to obey or they just refuse to listen, they receive a just reward. So here's the illustration, here's the example. The word of angels, the commands of God given to us, anyone who did not obey those commands or refused to listen to those commands received their just reward. We would say their payday. We would say their prize. We would say what was coming to them. What was the reward for sin? Romans chapter 6, verse 23. The wages or the reward of sin is death. So if anybody transgresses, if anybody disobeys the word of God, does not listen to the word of God, there is judgment. And the judgment is hell. We're not talking about physical death. This is spiritual death. This is eternal separation from God. And and I got to tell you, you want something that will motivate you to live a righteous life? Something that will motivate you to make sure you tell your neighbor about Jesus Christ? Take a look at what hell is. For in its totality, the way things will go down is according to Revelation chapter 20 verse 11, The very last thing that someone who is destined for hell will see is the throne of God. For they will stand before Jesus Christ. They will stand before the great white throne judgment where they will be judged according to their works because they refused the message of the gospel. They did not heed. They did not listen. And therefore, they will silently, they will not say a word, be condemned before they are cast into outer darkness, into the lake of fire that was prepared not for mankind, by the way. God never desired for any man to ever go into the lake of fire, to outer darkness. It was created, according to Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, for Satan and his fallen angels. But if we choose to reject the gospel, if we do not give heed, if we do not obey, then we by default choose to go instead to that lake of fire. It is a place, according to Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, of eternal torment. Fire, brimstone, day and night, mankind will suffer and there is absolutely no end. And this is the worst part. This is the most horrifying portion of hell. There is no hope, no escape, and no end. It is an eternal, endless, unredeemable separation from God Almighty. Matthew chapter 8 verse 12 describes it as the outer darkness where there is weeping because the people are absolutely crushed and gnashing because they're angry still with God of teeth. This is the penalty, the just reward for those who disobey the word of the angels, the commandments given by man. Which brings us to the question in verse 3. Nobody wants to go there. Segurado, therefore, how shall we escape? How do we escape that judgment? How do we keep ourselves from falling into that destiny of eternal separation? Now, the book of Hebrews, remind you, on this question of how we escape, 
is written to the mga Hudeo. And Jews had their own ideas about how to escape the judgment of hell, how we would say to get to heaven. For they trusted in this very same law, these rules, these regulations, the Ten Commandments, but it wasn't just ten, and the totality of the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, there's 613 commandments that they were trusting in to keep them from hell. Now, the law is good. In fact, in Romans chapter 7, verse 12, we're told the law is holy, righteous, and just. The law is perfect. The law is the standard. If we wanted to earn our way into heaven, we would do so by keeping the law. The problem is, although the law is perfect, Romans chapter 7, verse 14 says, Kita Salawayan. <laughs> we're not perfect. We're sinners. We're born in sin. We're actually under the bondage of sin. And it only takes one, James chapter 2, verse 10, sin, to keep us out of heaven. Therefore, the law cannot, rules and regulations are powerless to be able to help us escape from the bondage and the destiny of hell. That's not to say the law does not have a purpose. According to Romans chapter 7, verse 7, the law is the what instructs us, shows us our need for Jesus Christ. If I were to say to you, how fast do you drive a car? And you said, I go about yeah, maybe 100 kilometers an hour down the road, traveling from, you know, Silai down to, you know, Telisai or Telisai into Bacolod. And I said, what if I told you the speed limit was only 50 kilometers an hour? Oh, I didn't know. Now, that doesn't mean that if you're driving 100 kilometers, not knowing that you're not breaking the law, you still are. You would still be charged if LTO pulled you over. But once you know what the speed limit is, it then helps you to understand that you are a law breaker. You see, the law, rules, and regulations do nothing to change who we are, but they do show us who we are. They reveal the fact we are sinners. Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 says the law was our teacher to point us to Jesus Christ, to show us we were sinners in need of salvation. So, para sa mga Hudeo, the Hebrews, title of the book, they thought the law could help them. It could not. Pero ang iban sa mga tao, they argue, all roads lead to heaven. Muslims, Buddhists, peskin na lang, as long as you do your best, God will accept you. Once you get to heaven, the big pearly gates, hey, Peter will let you on in. He can come on. God's not going to turn you away. You're a good person. Really? Is that really what you believe? There is a bit of truth to that. Only in the fact that all roads do lead to the great white throne judgment, as we talked about in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. But that's not salvation. That's the beginning of eternal separation. That's the gateway to hell. You see, we want to get to heaven and stay in heaven. And it turns out there are not many roads. There's one. For we're told in John chapter 14 that there is one way, one truth, one life. And no man comes to the Father except through that which is Jesus Christ. We're told in Matthew chapter 7 verse 13 the exact same thing. Broad is the way. Lapagid ang dalan to destruction. It's puno puno gid. It's full of people. But narrow is the way, and few there are that find it, that leads to eternal life. How do we escape the judgment? How do we escape hell? It turns out there's just one way. In fact, Galatians chapter 2, verse 21 tells us, if there was any other way, then Jesus Christ died for no reason. And let me tell you, God did not offer himself as a sacrifice. God die upon the cross for no purpose. He is the only way. He is the only salvation. He is the only way to avoid destruction and eternal separation. Which is why, as verse 3 goes on, when we get this idea of how shall we escape? Certainly not by neglecting the great salvation. In other words, <clears throat> there is only one salvation. 
And if we neglect that one salvation, then we are going to not be able to escape the judgment that is to come. This word neglect, used five times only in the New Testament, carries the idea of not deeming something valuable. Thinking of it as less than important. If we don't think that the great salvation first given to us by Jesus Christ, he who died on the cross for our sins, if we neglect that, then really there is no hope for us. In Mark chapter 3, verses 28 and 29, we're told all sins will be forgiven to men. And whatever blasphemy they utter, that's forgiven, except the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. That is subject to eternal condemnation. We call it the unforgivable sin. And in fact, this idea of there being an unforgivable sin has often stirred up a lot of controversy and questions. So God will forgive everybody anything. When Jesus died upon the cross, He paid for everything except for the one unforgivable sin, which is to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? The idea is when the Spirit, John chapter 16, verse 8, convicts us of our need for Jesus Christ, reveals to us the fact that we should give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard, lest we drift away, when the Spirit puts that upon our heart, if we do not obey, if we reject that conviction of the Spirit, if we reject the only way we can be saved through Jesus Christ, then there is no hope for us. The one unforgivable sin is to neglect the great salvation. It is to not believe in Jesus Christ before we die. That is the one thing that God will never forgive because it means we've turned our back on the only thing that brings forgiveness. Therefore, notice, we should give heed to the things spoken of by the Lord. Give heed to the only way that we can escape, which is the cross and redemption through Jesus Christ. For 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says that God does not want anyone to perish. God does not want anyone to ever go to hell. And he made it easy, by the way. It's not hard. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10 says, If you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for our sins and was raised from the grave, Luas Nakita. Biscancino, Romans 10, 13 says, Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord, they will be saved. God made it so easy. But he doesn't make anyone do it. The door, the path to be saved, the path to heaven is available to all, open to anyone. And it's so easy to walk through. But we have to choose it. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 9 tells us we are saved by grace, regalo, alinsigino, through faith, it is the gift of God. Listen, there's nothing we have to do except receive and believe, obey and listen, give heed to the things that have been written. Recognize that Jesus, who is better than everyone and everything, is who we need to put our lives in. But it is our choice. And if we neglect, then we are saying we do not want heaven. Instead, we fall into the judgment and the destiny of hell. Well, that brings us to a third thing we want to look at there in verses 3 through 4, which is the fact that this salvation that has been given through Jesus Christ has been confirmed in three ways. We know this salvation, we know this truth because of the fact that it has been confirmed, ratified, verified by three different things. Number one, notice in the end of verse 3, our salvation has been confirmed by we who have heard. Now, the idea is, is that those who are saved, Luas Nagita, those who have already believed in Jesus Christ, we are the verification, the confirmation of the fact that this truly is the salvation, the only salvation that comes from God. How do we know that this is really the true gospel? 
How do we know that what the Bible says that Jesus Christ is really the way to be saved? I can't see Jesus. I didn't see the cross. I don't see heaven. I don't see hell. How can you prove to me these things are true? And the answer is, look at our lives. We are the validation. We are the confirmation of the truth of the gospel. For we have been transformed by Jesus Christ. We have been given new lives. Now, does that mean we're perfect? Take it out of the it. We will be in a battle with our flesh to the day we see the Lord. We struggle with sin, but we are now redeemed sinners. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 tells us we are the workmanship of God, created unto good works. He is working in our lives now, transforming our lives, making us to be someone different than we used to be. Listen, when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of us, when the gospel message impacts us, when the faith of Jesus Christ comes upon us, we are no longer the same person we used to be. We truly are a different individual. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 tells us that old things have passed away. All things have become new. We are that new creation in Christ. We are the validation. We are the first confirmation of the power and the truth of the message of salvation through Christ. But there's a second validation. Notice there in verse 4 in the beginning. Not only is this salvation confirmed through our lives, us who believe, it's also confirmed by signs, wonders, and miracles. Now this is speaking of the supernatural, things that are extraordinary, beyond the ordinary, that validate and confirm the message of the gospel. Now this was done by Jesus, it was also done by the apostles. For Jesus healed the sick. Jesus cast out demons. All that very extraordinary. Jesus even raised the dead. That's incredibly extraordinary. That is certainly a sign, a wonder, and a miracle. He did it three different times. In Mark chapter 5, verse 42, he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. In Luke chapter 7, verse 15, he raised the widow's son back to life. And to Katapusan in John chapter 11, verse 43, Lazarus was brought back to life. Hey, that's pretty amazing. But it wasn't just Jesus Christ. The apostles also did signs and wonders. Acts chapter 2, verse 43 tells us after the day of Pentecost that the gospel message was confirmed, was validated, was ratified by these signs and wonders. And some of them were quite amazing, by the way. Peter, according to Acts chapter 5, verse 15, he's just walking along the road. If his shadow, Yehandom, passed over people, they became healed. They did well. They actually were made better from whatever sickness they had just by the shadow of Peter walking by. In Acts chapter 19, verse 12, we're told Paul, he'd be working, he was a tent maker, so my balasha, he would get a sweat going, he'd use a, a trapo to wipe his sweat off. And he would put his trapo down, people would steal tawa i trapo. And they would like put his trapo, stinky, sweaty handkerchief, on those who were sick, demon possessed, and they would be cured and healed. Crazy, amazing, signs, wonders, miracles that validated and ratified the message of the gospel, the salvation through Jesus Christ. Here's the question for us. Jesus had signs and wonders. The apostles had signs and wonders. Do we still have signs and wonders today? The answer, of course, is yes. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same. Kahapon, subong, asasakatapusan. He never changes. And so if Jesus did it to the apostles, Jesus is still going to do it to us today. In fact, he would say in Luke chapter 17, that if we have the faith of a mustard seed, nothing will be impossible for us. Listen, all we simply need to do is look to Jesus, look to the source of our faith, the source of our strength. And yes, we will see signs, wonders, and miracles, subong, in our lives today. The same God is still working in us to validate, ratify, and confirm his message. But let me challenge you. I like this. Jesus would say to the disciples in John chapter 14, verse 12, 
Not only are you going to do the same works that I have done, signs, wonders, miracles, you will do greater things than these. Now, that always baffled me. What's greater than what Jesus did? I mean, okay, healing the sick, that's impressive. Casting out demons, that certainly shows power and authority. Raising the dead? I mean, that's kind of off the charts. We think, tapos na, there's no more hope for them. And Jesus said, hmm, my my chance pa. And he would bring back, that's incredible. So what is greater than what Jesus did? Giving the message of the gospel. And you might go, well, what does that prove as being better? If we heal someone that's sick, chances are, dugay dugay, they'll become sick again. If you bring back someone from the dead, that's very impressive, by the way. That's certainly showing a great power and wonder. That's a sign and miracle. But dugay dugay, mapatay sila naman. They're temporary fixes. But if you give someone the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you give someone the power of the gospel to transform their life, that is kalibutan, kag, pwede naman kato sila sa langit. Now that is certainly a greater sign and wonder, a greater miracle than anything else that was mentioned. The greatest of all is the message of the gospel, the sign, wonder, and miracle that transforms people's lives. But there's a third validation, a third confirmation that we see there at the end of verse 4, that this message of the gospel is the one true salvation that can bring us to heaven, keep us from hell, the way we escape the condemnation to come. And that is the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Our salvation is confirmed by the gifts of the Spirit. Now the word gifts here is a bit unique. It's only mentioned twice in the New Testament. It literally means the division or the partition. It's used here. It's also used in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, talking about the word of God dividing the soul and spirit, cutting us under the thoughts and the intents of the heart of men. Same word. But by context, we take this to mean the regalo sanguino, the supernatural, the spiritual gift, the charismatic gifts that are given to believers once they come to Jesus Christ. Now these gifts... They cannot be purchased. Anybody want to buy it? Acts chapter 8, verse 20. Actually, Peter rebuked Simon the sorcerer. And he actually said, you know, may you be condemned because you thought you could purchase the gifts of God. Anybody want to buy it? They are something that is given to us by the Spirit of God as he sees fit. And there are about 23 of these gifts listed in the New Testament. You have the spiritual gifts, the practical gifts in Romans chapter 12. You have the supernatural gifts listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And you have the offices of the gift in Ephesians chapter 4. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. All of these gifts are given by the Spirit to validate, to confirm the truth of the message of the gospel. The only way to be saved. It's probably worth mentioning. There are certain denominations who try to say these gifts no longer exist. Their argument is, for the first church, in the book of Acts, the gifts were given for the purpose of validation, to prove the message of the gospel, because the word of God, ang pulang sang Diyos, wala patapos. But once the word of God was complete, we had not just the Old Testament, but Sabilok's a New Testament naman, the 27 books of the New Testament were added. There was no longer the need for the gifts to validate the message, for we had the totality of, or the completion of the word. They point back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 10, which they argue says, when that which is perfect, meaning the Bible, is complete, is come, then that which is in part, referring to the signs, wonders, and miracles, that should be done away. The churches that believe that, they teach that. The spiritual gifts ceased with the first church. But the gifts of the Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, be it those practical gifts in Romans 12, the gift of administration, the gift of faith, the gift of giving, the gift of helps, 
or be it the supernatural gifts in Roman and 1 Corinthians chapter 12, talking about the gift of healing, the gift of miracles, the gift of tongues, the interpretation of tongues. Or those offices, those apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, those are just as necessary today as they were in the days of the first church. And Peter would clarify it, Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39, and say, listen, this gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit, these gifts that he give you are for you, in your mga bata, in your mga apo, asa sa katapusan. Listen, they're for every generation, they're for every person. And there's no end to it. They are the validation of the salvation that we have received in Jesus Christ. But that does bring up one final thought. How do I know what gift I have? You know, what gift have I been given? Well, two things in regard to that. One, we're given a gift. Notice there at the very conclusion of verse 4, according to His will. Meaning, God... The his there points back to the beginning of verse 4 where it talks about God. He chooses what he desires as far as which gift he gives to us. Now we all have a gift. Basta me my regalo na. First Peter chapter 4 verse 10 says we've all been given a gift to be able to minister to and to edify the body of Christ. What gift are we given? Whatever gift God wants to give us. It's his choice. He gives them as he sees fit. And he can give us one, all, or any combination thereof for whatever purpose we need. We're not defined by our gifts. We're defined by Jesus Christ. Never let it be said, I am a healer, or I am a evangelist, or a prophet, or a pastor, or I am an administrator, or I am a giver, or piscana no. Those are gifts God gives for a time and a season as the body of Christ has need. They're not our definition. Our definition is simply Jesus Christ. For 1 Corinthians 12, 11 says, The Spirit works in all things, distributing individually as He wills. Hey, God gives the gifts, however, to whomever He chooses. But that still points out the question, how do I know what gift then God gave? Pero paano ka ko? Ano akong regalo? Acts chapter 16. We'll finish up with this. For in Acts 16, we're given this beautiful story of the Apostle Paul on his second missionary journey. As he was traveling, he did not know where to go. Para pa so he tried a couple of things. We're told in Acts chapter 16, verse 6, he tried to go into Asia. I don't think of Asia as being the continent of Asia. Asia was the province of Asia, there in the southern portion of what's modern day Turkey. But God said, I said, okay, not Asia. So then he tried to go into Bithynia. Bithynia would have been to the northeast of where he was. So he tried to go southwest? No. He tried to go northeast. And the Spirit said, I said, What's interesting though, is apparently he didn't just try once. By the grammar there in the passage, he tried over and over and over again. To the point of where he finally went, okay, Bithynia is not it because I've tried, 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 tried again, and it's just not opening, it's not happening. That must be God's way of saying, don't do that. Now what I love about this is Paul found out where to go. Eventually he goes down to Troas. From Troas, he crosses over the Aegean, comes to the city of Neapolis. From there, he comes up to the city of Philippi, where he meets a woman named Lydia and begins a church that he called Duga Duga, his joy and his crown. But he found the path because he was stepping out to try. He tried Asia, Indi. He tried Bithynia, Indi. Bithynia naman, wala pa. Bithynia? No. Sigurad na Bithynia? No, not Bithynia. Okay, we won't go there. Let's try Troas. Oh, that's the right direction because he never stopped stepping out. If we want to know what gift God has given to us, step out. We have to try. As we step out in faith, if we might say, and it waited, that's not the right way. The Spirit says, don't do that. Okay, not that direction. I know what not to do. Let me step out a different direction. How about this? Is this my gift? Is this my calling? Is this what God desires to do in my life? Hey, that one brought fruit. That one 
shows the work of the Lord. That must be where I'm supposed to be. Step out to find out what God has called you to do so that we can validate the salvation, prove the work of Jesus Christ within us, and therefore let people see that he is better than everyone and everything. You pull this all together, it is a beautiful, although heavy, warning. Hey, in light of all that we saw in chapter 1, better than the prophets, better than the angels, we must give the more earnest heed. Not just listen, but lay hold of. Apply, obey. This salvation that we have been given, do not let it slip away. But instead, make it all in our lives, everything to us. Because ultimately, life is about knowing Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this day to gather together, Lord, to be able to get into your word. Lord, to receive in a heavy warning from your word. Lord, we understand there is just one road. Lapad girang dalan sa imperno. Damo mga tao po. Nipis na lang ang dalan. Apod sa himo lang, gino. And that's the road we want to be on. Lord, there's just one way, one salvation, one hope, one escape from the judgment that is to come. You have not made it hard. But there's also not many ways. So Lord, let us give the more earnest heed. Pay attention. Be steadfast. Obey and listen to your word. Not just for our lives, but Lord, there might be those who are the example, the testimony, the proof to the fact that you are what life is all about. So we thank you. We praise you. Lord Jesus, we say in Jesus' name, amen. We'll read ahead. We'll finish up with Hebrews chapter 2, Deson Simana, as we conclude this section talking about Jesus being better than the angel. So wrap it up with the conclusion next week. Till then, give the more earnest heed. Be steadfast. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Love you guys. God bless you. We'll see you next week.